Ready for takeoff. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks for joining us uh, live here on Zoom and for those over on YouTube for our CNS talk today. Today we have Fernando with us who has a background in theoretical physics and applied mathematics. So very much out of my comfort zone, um, but it's going to be amazing to expand the horizon. Um, And since 2019, if I'm not mistaken, he is a research associate at the Department of Anatomy and Neurosciences in Amsterdam. Now, in the run up, um, you all saw the title, The Emergence of Higher Order Hubs. Um, We had a little discussion about uh, the the pitch of the talk and actually we have the pleasure today that Fernando is going to give two talks in one for us. So uh, we're going to see the established work and he's going to take us to his new work. Without further ado, thank you so much for being here. We're quite excited about this talk and I hand over to you. Uh, Thanks Seth for the nice introduction. It's my great pleasure to come here. So I heard a lot from Eduardo about the group and the seminars. So it's very really nice to be here. So should I share my screen? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, okay, let me see if I can put in the right. Do you see presentation? Not yet. Yeah, so this is the right screen, right? Okay. Uh, so the title of the talk is like about my new work. Let's say our new work is always group work. Uh, but to build the motivation for this work, I will talk from work that uh, was published 2019 on topological phase transitions in functional brain networks. Oh, yeah, the, the context is that, uh, so I have this background that's in theoretical physics and mathematics, but I have the privilege to join the anatomy and neuroscience uh, department at the Multinet division. So the, and uh, gave me opportunity to learn a lot of clinical neuroscience, but also continuing uh, the theoretical aspects, but now really much more narrowed to, to human brain and functional connectivity uh, research. So as I said, I, I'm in the Multinet lab, so led by Linda Down. So in this, we're pointing the mouse here. And uh, one of the faces in this team, you know, like Eduarda, she's also part-time in our lab. So we're very happy for that. She's our GitHub uh, boss, kind of like she manages like of the code of the lab and also not only the code, but also the research. She's involved in the different projects and the team is very interdisciplinary from like pure neuroscientists to neuro-oncologists to psychologists and to theoretical physicists like myself. So this is our introduction to the lab. Uh, in the lab, there's a, but the name is refers to mood scale and to mood multi-layer network. So in, in the sense that uh, we want to investigate the brain across scales and across image modalities. So I put only one slide about the top, like the main topic that you can work in the lab. It is, it's called, we call it multi-layer network. So we have uh, different image modalities and we try to concatenate in a single network all the modalities. This is just an uh, advertisement for the lab. What I will talk today will be more on the, the this work I just mentioned. Uh, and this previous work was uh, also with Linda Dow, but other, other peers, both in Brazil and in Amsterdam. And this is called like topological phase transitions in functional brain network. So you'll be clear why I can merge from this work to, to the high order hubs soon, I hope. Uh, Basically, one of the reasons like now is that I'm also affiliated to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Amsterdam, and I got a fellowship that to, to answer some sort of uh, fundamental question or hard questions. I got a lot of help to answer questions that could be uh, difficult to do it alone and also has important application to neuroscience, I hope, but it's a th- theoretical in the concept of the conceptualization. So which question do I want to answer? I want to understand complex systems, like in which sense, like systems that we don't know much about the dynamics or what's the underlying model. So, and then of course, 
the brain is one of the most complex systems. Like the, there is no no established model for the brain, and I I don't know whether we we see this anytime soon. So then we want to contribute in different ways. So the neuroscience is a very interdisciplinary field. So the contribution you can give from theoretical physics and applied mathematics to neuroscience would be establishing uh, more rigorous ways to understand or analyze the brain. So that's the one of the core like uh, questions to that I, we want to answer in this fellowship. But what I really want to add to neuroscience is, is the uh, network paradigm. So I think some of you already know, but does not cost much to repeat. Like there's a universal way to encode information about the brain. So it's very hard to do a very accurate uh, study in the brain across scales, because like if you go to the microscope scale, you may have accurate uh, information about the brain, but you only have uh, in a small uh, percentage of the brain, like a small uh, sample. And if you go to image modalities, you can, let's say you do MRI scan, you can see partially the whole brain, but it's a coarse representation, you miss a lot. So there are the, it's very hard to have a proper way of investigating the brain. So you try many ways. And one universal way to encode information about the brain is, is the network. So basically in this example, like I give example for, for resting state fMRI, you have two areas in the brain where you collect the, the bold signal, and then you define what in mathematics you would call similarity measures. So how you can check whether there is communication or inf information flow or correlation or any other metric that you want to compute uh, between two areas of the, of the brain. And if this is true, if, if we use any sort of mathematical method to say, oh, there is a connectivity between these two areas, you address a link. So this is so-called functional connectivity. And if you do that for all the links in the brain, you can have this uh, sort of uh, whole brain, like functional brain network. So by the way, these animations were made by work, the recent work that was also together with Eduardo, where we have a tutorial how to make this network annotations and network analysis in the brain. But uh, what I want you'd like to answer is this high order paradigm. Uh, if you go to arguments in, within neuroscience, we know that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of kilometers of brain. I don't know, but I think it's about 150,000 kilometers of fibers. And we know also that modularity is uh, emergent proper of the brain. So the brain is split in modules and they are hierarchically organized and et cetera, et cetera. What does it mean? That means that if your model brain has a network, uh, accounting for PYs connectivity is not necessarily a complete way. So I can give an example in communication network. So I had several conversations with Eduardo. So let's say I'm node A, Eduardo is node B. And I assume that uh, Eduardo had several conversations with Stephanie, so then B and C. But I, I never seen until today had a, a real uh, interaction like a face to face or, or real world interaction between uh, Stephanie and myself. And even now that today we have this interaction, it is not clear that we have the three point interaction. Like the three three people talking is is not is not well approximated uh, by the sum of the talks. Let's say A talks to B, B talks to C, C talks to A. It's not necessarily the same as A B C talking. So this example maybe gives you a hint that uh, there is some uh, room for improvement in network analysis in the sense that you could track for real high order interactions, so interactions that are beyond the two areas of the brain, but they are actually, they are actually uh, between more than three or more areas in the brain. So that's the high order paradigm of how we can process uh, the a signal in the brain that take these into account. So the my my current work wants to contribute in this field. So that's like this paradigm. But why we want to do that? That's a 
important. So I just don't want to make a calculations in the brain. I, that is a why. So from a theoretical perspective, a network is a projection of a, a structure that is high order. So this is a good example, like in physics or in mathematics, we approximate everything by circles or spheres or whatever. Like, let's say now that we have like a, these 15 circles are 15 brains. Of course, I can try to spot differences or characterize those brains. Oh, but, and you can say, oh, this one is thicker. This is green, this is blue. So you can, this is a bit bent. So you can spot difference, but this is a planar representation of the brain. So you, you spot a brain, and then when you create a, a network, uh, under a mathematical perspective, because you only connect, connect pairs of links, you are making a, a projection. So you only approximate, uh, is a planar approximation of, of the brain. If you, if you would like to have a triplets or quadruplets, so interactions that are beyond pairwise, this would be uh, more like meaningful. So how can I say that? If I play this animation, you see now, that, that the reason, like, what I want to tell is that things that look very similar in a planar representation, they may are really different in a high order representation. So what I want to tell with that's that if you take into account interactions in the brain that are not only between two areas, but between several areas in the brain, you may find a lot of stuff that you didn't uh, find if you start the brain only in the PY setting. So that's kind of a pictorial uh, explanation why it's important. And I hope that convinced you. So, but then why I'm, I, I'm moving to this direction. So that was in because of our previous work on the topological phase transition in functional brain networks. Uh, I was trained in theoretical physics and my expertise was in phase transitions and topology. And uh, I will give you like a crash course on phase transitions and try to explain how can translate what we know from phase transitions in, in theoretical physics to what we may know now in phase transitions in, in the brain or at least in, fu in functional networks. So when you talk about phase transitions, we always think about water boiling. So that's like, I had to come then with this example, but uh, we can define a phase transition as uh, something that when you change uh, your system, just a small, small change in the system leads to a huge change in the structure of the system. So if you have uh, water, let's say at 20 degrees and you raise the temperature to 21, nothing changed. 22, not change, nothing changed. But uh, let's say at sea level, in all conditions, you have water at 99.9 degrees, and suddenly you just increase a little bit to 100 degrees. There is a major change in the property of water. So the, the water belong, becomes also uh, vapor. So there is a phase transition between liquid and, uh, and gas. So this kind of transition is well established and well understood in physics. And one marker for that in terms of mathematics are singularities or peaks in the, in the metrics that you can compute within physics. So that comes to the next slide. Probably you, you know that like when you have water boiling, you, I think in high school, you have this phase diagram. So you have ice or water or vapor. And then depending if you, if you have a, a constant uh, pressure, then the transition for boiling and vapor is like at 100 degrees at one ATM, but you have this kind of diagram and another that's more technical, but you also can quantify phase transition when you have these singularities in your thermodynamic quantity. So if you trace the, the specific heat of like, let's say water or, uh, versus the temperature and you reach a critical temperature, you have this pattern like a spike in your, in your metric. So, Knowing that, I, I don't think is enough to move to network. So it's just like a crash course by, by no means. Especially functional brain networks. So how then 
we can translate this idea of transition to, to network topology. So it's, it's quite different to understand the water and to understand a network. So in a network, I would I would bring more geometric interpretation. So you have a, you can define some sort of phase like it's not anymore water, liquid, a gas or vapor or solid. So the, the phase I will quantify now are more geometric, how, how the network is organized. Uh, in terms of connectivity, so if you keep that in mind, uh, may you you can navigate through this work. So what what I will define now are the markers that uh, in physics uh, are known to predict phase transition, and you can also compute those markers in networks. That's the the bridge. So we want to make some sort of bridge between what is known in theoretical physics and uh, what can be also uh, computable or observable in, in a network. Uh, and this quantity, some of you may know, is called an Euler characteristic. So why this the name of this quantity is Euler characteristic? So I go to back to Plateau. So there is this uh, fairy tale, like, like story about the platonic solids, where you get the tetrahedra, hexahedra, octahedra, etc. And then you, you count how many vertices this tetrahedra has, like oh, four vertices. So how many edges? Oh, six edges. How many faces? Okay, four faces. If you make vertices minus edges plus face, it always sounds true. If you do the same for a cube, the eight vertices, 12 edges, six faces sounds true. And you do that for all the so called platonic solids, you, sum, you get the same result. And back then, uh, there was some mystic uh, reasoning for that. Oh, this is really uh, the elements, fire, water, et, uh, et cetera. So there was a mystic reason, but fortunately, Euler, actually the inventor of network science, of the, the first network scientist, he also proved that mathematically why this is correct. And the reason is that all those solids are uh, equivalent to a sphere when you deform those solids. So, and why I'm saying that, because when you go, that's the only slide I, I have no, like, it's more technical, I'll show now. When you go to theoretical physics, if you compute this quantity in theoretically, not only in a polyhedra, like, you can define this quantity in any uh, domain. If you compute this quantity, I, I, you can also identify phase transition. So the, I, I just want for exhaustion, show a lot of uh, examples where you compute the Euler characteristics and identify phase transitions in theoretical physics. So uh, I wrote a few of those papers, but there, there is a huge area in theoretical physics where this is uh, known. It's not unique, so there are other ways and other metrics that could identify phase transitions. But this is known in physics that you could uh, trace phase transitions, uh, at least in physics, uh, using this marker. And then what's the good news about this marker is that you can also compute the other characters in a brain network. So in this work, it was very, this work was very applied. So we analyzed a lot of brain networks, but the motivation was theoretical. So we just would like to check whether if we would compute the other characteristics for, for a brain network, for a function brain network, it, we would find that those transitions. So for that, I will show a video uh, that's the so-called like filtration, where you have some sort of a geometric interpretation for this process. So in the top left, you only have the nodes, so the vertices of your network. But in the top right, you have what you already know, like the links of a network. Uh, so if you think about this polyhedra formula from Euler, what you want to compute are like vertices in a network. What are the edges? What are the faces? What are the high order faces? Like, and uh, in network theory, uh, you have to compute all possible all to all uh, connectivity. So the vertices are the vertices, edges. Then I go for triangles, for tetrahedra, for pentagon. So it's a geometric way to uh, take into account this number. And because we knew in physics that it would be this would be a good marker, we, tr we trace it in, in, in the brain. So I'm only illustrating here up to order four, but we go up to our computational power, basically. So order one is only the vertices, order two is like the, the PYs connectivity, like the links, and order three is like triangles, like put earlier than you see that I'm only 
computing triangles and all, all the four tetrahedra and so on. So basically, if you compute this, uh, this process is called filtration and, and I'm doing the same computation for every density in the brain. So the filtration is one method that is using the topic like it's called topological data analysis. So that's the, the, the sub area of like network science that we are using to understand the brain under this perspective. Uh, and basically this video shows how is the brain for every possible density. So for zero density, I have no nodes, no links, anything. And if I slightly increase the density, then I have uh, new edges and I have new triangles and new tetrahedron. So what, what then we are observing in these uh, transitions? We are observing uh, what people call a giant component transition. So a transition where the brain network becomes uh, connected. So if you have a very sparse brain network, there is no full connectivity between all the areas of the brain. And at some point, there will be like a critical density where any point A and B in the brain can be connected. That, that means that there is a path between any point A and B in your brain network. So this transition is known uh, since like the, the 60s, like it's called Erdos Heni trans transition. So it was discovered by the, these two mathematicians and uh, can be illustrated in this figure in top right. But what I'm arguing now is that you can also have transitions that are high order. In what sense? Like, here I'm saying I can cover the brain with links, but I can also cover the brain with lots of triangles, or I can cover the brain with lots of uh, tetrahedra. So if you think the brain has a lattice, or like like and you start start putting uh, tiles in the lattice, so if you put only links, it's one sort of transition. If you put more than links, but put also uh, triangles, is a different transition, and so so on. So that said, I may uh, put this analogy in terms of a surface. So you start with an empty brain network, and then you keep putting the strongest links in your network until you put as many links as you can. And that is analogous to building a surface. And there will be a critical value of, of density where the, the brain is connected. So this is, that's why I, I mean, now that the interpretation of this transition is geometric, like we are used to to investigate dynamics in the brain, but in this specific example, uh, the interpretation is geometric. And then for analogies, like it's like level set. So this is a, this is a torus, and then if I slice the torus, there is nothing. And then at some point, like in the first, I start to slice this torus, there is nothing. At some point, I can see the first handle uh, of the torus being. Uh, created, and then at some point you have a second transition where the torus is completely closed. So this is some, some sort of geometric analogy. And what's the nice fact about this is that uh, if I compute the Euler characteristics of this on, on this process, uh, uh, every time I have a peak in the Euler in the in Euler entropy, so the, the logarithm of the Euler characteristics, I can identify those transitions and. Then I, I jump directly to the result in the brain. So I, it's just like more highlight that if you then compute uh, the Euler characteristics for, for these brain networks, you eventually find these peaks that I show in the beginning of the seminar that are signatures of phase transitions. So for this example, we have about, I don't know the exact number, sorry. It was a while ago, like about 500, uh, Connectivity matrix from resting state fMRI from healthy individuals. They are illustrated in, in gray and they in blue have uh, the mean. So, what I'm saying is that we find like three peaks in this uh, using this strategy, using this approach. And the first peak means uh, connectivity on the links, like a full, you can connect the brain through links between any points A and B. And then the second peak is connectivity through triangles. So there will be always, uh, at least with very high probability, that you can find the uh, paths of, of triangles that cover the brain. So they, you shoot a triangle, you can cover the whole brain with triangles at this specific uh, uh, density or threshold in the brain. And then the same for, for extra order, like for tetrahedron. So that's kind of the, the geometrical meaning of these transitions. 
and uh, what why it came to that so that why this would be helpful for for neuroscience uh, then I come back to physics so why, why this is not is helpful for physics so if I come to, to you and ask so something boils at 100 degrees which material is this material that boils at 100 degrees then most people say, oh, this is very likely to be water. I learned in high school that water boils at 100 degrees. And uh, if you would say, oh, something boils at 180 degrees. I don't know if it is correct. I'm sorry, I didn't check that. But let's say 80 degrees, oh, 180 degrees. What is that? Oh, this is maybe butter. Or something boils at 70 degrees. What's that? Oh, this is uh, alcohol. You know what I mean? Like you, uh, the boiling point of a material is a marker is a is a marker of material so if you if you make this idea forward like you say oh actually if in physics that was the case maybe that can be the case for for networks uh, and uh, that's what we investigated so we then like in, in this group we have a in, in interest in studying glioma so we had a smaller cohort like and match the controls between glioma individuals, like individuals with glioma and the health individuals. So of course, there's a different, it's a bit more noisy the, the data for the glioma, but when you make this diagram for, for this uh, cohort and compare the glioma versus control individuals, you see what the example that I just told you. Oh, uh, we can actually distinguish the, the different uh, let's say boiling points or melting points, if you want to make the analogy with physics, uh, that different groups, uh, they have different uh, phase transitions. So that was a, a ni really nice. And as far as we know, that was the first uh, time that we made this, uh, someone made this translation between theoretical physics and applied mathematics to real data. And uh, then since then, that was like two and a half years ago, there were quite a few works that used this idea. So the first that I remember was applying the same idea for the first phase transition in individuals with attention deficit disorder and comparing to, to typical developing uh, kids. And there, there was other applications in other domains in, in uh, just out patterns when you have a stimuli to image. So that, there was uh, applications in, in different uh, uh, complex systems. So that's like, what we just had uh, accepted for publication. So if you want to check uh, how does it work for, for different complex systems, that is a similar idea, but uh, there are applications in financial networks. So if you build a, a network of stocks, let's say each stock is a node, and then the correlation between the price of those stocks are the links. So when they, there is a switch in the stock, like a crash in the stock, there is a phase transition also in this network. Or that there were quite some uh, different applications. So we just uh, like uh, one and a half, two weeks ago, we got accepted a paper where we explored this uh, property in, in empirical system. So if you, you can you use that, of course, I cannot claim that it's a universal way to have a, like a biomarkers in your data, because it could be that two materials that are different, they have the same boiling point. So it's not, like it's one direction. So if you have, if you know the boiling point of a material, you may characterize the material, but there's nothing forbidding two materials to have the same boiling point. So you have to take that into account, but uh, it, it's being used for, for different uh, complex systems, like in protein networks or in financial networks or in different systems in, in, in neuroscience. So that was the motivation that, oh, why you want to go for, for this, so why I want to go now for for this high order structure, and then uh, I don't know if there is interaction of the questions, so how it works because it's a live transmission. But if you want to make make questions, feel free. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I will move to the high order, like how you can move from these transitions to the high order interactions. Uh, so. This work is kind of uh, established. Of course, there are lots of things to still do to apply in different systems to better understand the interpretation of these transitions and how it works in the brain and neuroscience or different modalities. But there is a way already set for, for this topic. Uh, 
And now I, I wanted to discuss our current work, which is called like high order, emergence of high order hubs in the human connectome. So basically coming back to this paradigm, we have a signal processing problem. Uh, all, most of signal processing uh, tools to build networks are pairwise. So you, you always take into account two time series, let's say if you still stick to fMRI, uh, and then you want to compute the connectivity between two areas in the brain, and then there is an algorithm like piston correlation or, or different metrics to define an edge in the brain. But there is no established way to define the three areas of the brain are interacting. So the, the goal of the, the methodological goal of this project is to explore possible ways to define this high order communication. I, I put only three nodes here, but it could be for any size. And then that is, was strongly sponsored by, by IS, and there was these two parts. So the part one is the methodology, how to process the signal this way, and part two, let's apply that into the brain. Uh, so the core question is how to explore those interactions, and then how to do that in resting state fMRI. So I'm, I'm trying to show what I did in, with the, we did in question one, and uh, how to quantify that in fMRI and what are the most important high order interactions. So then when you talk, talk about most important interactions with we, we network language, say hubs. So what are the hubs of those interactions? For that to happen, I had the help of many people. This was a very hard question, especially the signal processing part was not my expertise. So how to make this to happen? So beyond the, the colleagues at our lab, our team, I got help for lots of mathematicians. So these are uh, one photo to thank you all of them. Uh, people from UVA and from Imperial, from Amsterdam, from Valparaiso in Chile, in Rio. So there was a really nice team of people to develop this methodology. And uh, what, what's the, the main idea? So if you have this PYs uh, methodology, like and you, if you want to build a, a brain network, you want, uh, let's say, true brain signals so if you want to build a functional brain network and they want to compute, uh, let's say, a correlation between these two signals and that you define the network. That slide I already showed. But what I want to do next is an extension of this. So I, instead of throwing my algorithm three or two signals, I throw in now three signals and I have a question. Oh, are those three areas of the brain talking at the same time or not? What is done so far is approximation. So when two areas talk in the uh, A to B, B to C, and C to A, then in most uh, methods in, in network science, we say the three areas are talking, but this is not necessarily true, uh, as I explained in the beginning of the seminar. So what we want to, to convey here is to check, oh, is there any possible metric that takes into account the information shared between three areas of the brain? And that the answer for that is theoretically yes. The information theory, so is a very old topic since the beginning of communication, already developed metrics to quantify uh, signals that are shared between more than two parts. So that's, that's the branch of mathematics that we took into account. But in the end of the day, instead of having areas A and B in a connectivity matrix, we have now areas A, B, C, or I, J, K, and then you have a high order connectivity matrix. So you have a three areas of the brain and they want to, to, to check whether they have connectivity or not, then you just would check what's the strength between the, this metric that takes into account communication uh, that's beyond PYs. So if you want a first example for that, so you create this high order network and that's an example. I'm, I'm only now taking into account triplets in the brain. So I'm only computing triplets in the brain. And here you can see that the the, those triplets that I illustrate here are the strongest triplets that you can find using this idea. And they, they reflect uh, specific uh, systems in the brain, especially like uh, vision areas and motor areas, but I will go in more detail soon. How does it work? Uh, but basically in terms of methodology, we develop a methodology to, to quantify uh, communication in the brain that is beyond the uh, two areas. And uh, the question is whether this is meaningful or is on only a lot of mathematics. So that, that's, that's the next 
questions. So the, are, are those communications that we are trying to observe uh, compatible with any system in the brain? So that's next question. So as we may know, ask, like, what, how you can complete communication between three areas in the brain? This is kind of a zoo because you can think, oh, I want the information that is uniquely shared between three areas of the brain. So this a gray area where I point here with the mouse. Or no, I want the whole information between the three areas. Then it will be the whole, like if I represent like this Venn diagram, it will be the, all those three circles together. Like if you think about the communication net, uh, networks between people, let's say A is me, B is Eduardo, C is Stephanie. So this is kind of, what's the information that three of us have at the same time? If I want to get the whole information, what's the information that some together the three of us we have? And if I want something intermediate, I, this blue area is called a total correlation. So the sum of the pair of wise uh, information together. So for every of those uh, areas that I show, there is one metric that you can compute, and then you can associate this uh, idea of uh, multi-body information to, uh, to, to the brain. So this, these names already exist, so I'm sorry with this uh, vocabulary, but basically the joint entropy means everything. The mutual information is only the inter intersection. The total correlation is the PYs uh, between the pairs, like this blue area. And the S information is like some magnitude between those three connectivities. And the O information is more whether this, this interaction exists only at the three-point level or also exists at two-point level. So that there are more than those five, but for this work, I explored these five ways of processing the signal like that. Uh, and then at the, the end of the day, you have the, the high order network. If I want to go behind the scenes, it, it always end up in an Excel spreadsheet, a CSV file. So just to make fun, like, oh, behind the scenes, what's going on? So uh, these results are illustrated to AL Atlas. And in the end, I have uh, areas one to three, one to four, and all possible combination of areas. And I have a score whether these three areas are talking or not. So basically, that's uh, analogous to what you do in brain networks. But in brain networks, you represent just a, a, areas one, two, one, three, one, four. So you do it in PYs, and you know how much the connectivity in each, each area. So for every choice of, of communication that you want to observe in the brain, you have a different uh, pattern of distribution between this communication. And that's a starting point. Uh, now I will go back to more like a conceptual results. So how do you how do you then quantify these interactions and what is the meaning or potential meaning, starting meaning? This is a beginning. Uh, so for this interaction information, that is the mutual information, that's the sharing information between the three areas. You, I'm now illustrating. I already showed this before, but I didn't tell what was it. I'm illustrating the, the first, uh, I think, 200 uh, interactions that you can measure, the strongest 200 interactions that you can measure in the brain. And this consistency with uh, rest state activity, but it would be even better if you make a trick that I will explain soon, which is uh, hardness. So because we are in triplets, so if you go back to this slide where I, I show behind the scenes, how many triplets do you have between nine two areas? There's a lot, so it's one to three, one to four, one to five. When you count the amount of triplets, you have 125,000 triplets. So you can you really cover a lot of the brain. So when you have this much information, like in, in applied mathematics, you want, you do like principal component analysis or you want to make a methodology to, to uh, summarize the, the information to a smaller set. So what, what we did was just like that. So there's too much data. Easily, like if you go to this video, like you already know, you easily cover the brain very quick because of the amount of triplets and quadruplets and everything you have in the brain. So we now want only to, to, to observe uh, the most important triplets, not only not all these hundred thousand, but the most important ones. And uh, that's summarized the whole second part of the talk. So I, I have fMRI data. I use uh, these metrics that process the signal that try to uh, measure the communication between three or more areas of the brain. And then I create this uh, high order network. So a network only of the areas that are communicating more than PYs. With this higher network, 
you can use a principal component analysis and then discover what are the most important. And is a surprise, I will show it soon. Those most important areas co correspond to, uh, is, are compatible to specific systems in the brain. So this example is the vision system. Uh, and then what I mean is that, okay, you don't have uh, enough uh, power to analyze 125,000 triplets, but then I can use the same mathematics of uh, usual networks. So just give an example in geometry, distance between two points, is, you just use Pythagoras theorem, like the square of the X and the Y, and then squared, then you get the distance. If you go to three dimensions, it's just the same with extra variable. If you go to four dimensions, you cannot even draw, but it's the same formula. So the nice part of this approach is that the, all the network analysis that we know in brain in neuroscience uh, are feasible for for this higher interaction. So if you if you give me this uh, information, I can we lost him there for a minute. So this is simple just to sorry. Uh, you, you were cutting out. We lost you for a minute. Oh, sorry. Where did I stop? That's fine if you could could do that again. Thank you. Ah, so where I stopped it here or where, where was out? Sorry. Uh, on the slide towards the end. This one or this? Uh, this one, the rationale. Okay. So the rationale is, is that uh, we have a time series like a fMRI data. And then you want a metric that traces the communication between more than two areas in the brain. And then with this, three met this metric, you can throw in, let's say, three signals, and then you get a triplet in the brain. You do that for all possible triplets. And then you get a, you get a high order uh, network. So a network of all possible triplets. But this is way too much if you go to, to this. Uh, uh, behind the scenes, like 120,000 tri triplets is just a lot. Then you can go to to uh, PCA analysis to discover the hub. So what's the most important triplets? And then when you make this analysis, only a uh, bench of triplets are meaningful, and those triplets represent specific systems in the brain. So this example uh, is we have like the vision uh, hubs. So that's kind of the rationale. If I go to the like operational, we have a uh, analogy with uh, geometry. So if you if you go to distance, like a Pythagoric, Pythagoras theorem in geometry, you, we know that the distance between two points are, is like proportional to the square of the uh, x square plus y square. So you get this Pythagoras theorem. If you do it in 3D, it's just an extra term. If you do like a, the z square comes to the formula. If you go to 4D, you cannot even draw a line in 4D, but you know that the distance in 4D is just uh, include a new uh, coordinate. What I want to tell with this slide is that for this high order connectivity, all the metrics that we know are the same. It's just that now uh, they are uh, high order. So if you want to design a, what's a hub in a brain network, so it's the most important node. Now that I compute the triplets, or what's a hub is the most important triplet. So it's not uh, in terms of the meaning, you can translate the meaning towards uh, the new variables. And how do we do that? So in this example, just to illustrate how I define the hubs for triplets, I have like one, two, three, four triangles, and they form a, a network of triangles. And of course, on purpose, the most important triplet is the central one. So if I create a network of triplets where I say, ah, if two triangles are connected when they share a link, I, I can create this network. So if I put labels in these, let's say triangle one is A, B, D. So is this A, B, D, triangle two, B, C, E, and so, and so on. You can create a matrix that says that, okay, is triangle one and three connected? Yes, then I connect them, I put a one in the matrix. So. Uh, one with three, this connectivity, one. Three and two is connected, yeah. Then I go and put a link between a node three, a triangle three and two. So the, the structure 
is the same structure that you have in network analysis. So uh, you have connectivity matrix that uh, define connectivity between areas of the brain. The only difference is that these metrics are now representing the triplets in the brain. So if you use a definition of hub, that's called like eigenvector centrality. So you discover the most important area in the brain. If you use the same formula in, in this triplet case, is the same result. So here I compute the centrality for all these triangles, and then we have the obvious result, the B, D, and E is the best, the most important triangle. So it's if you do that for the brain, then you can also find the most important triangles in the brain. The only difference is that here I only had four triangles for an example, and what we did, we did for 125,000 triangles. We select the the first strongest ones, like the first the thousand strongest ones to make this calculation. Otherwise, you don't have computational power. And uh, we, we rank those triangles based on the connectivity. And uh, that's kind of the final part of the talk. So basically, if I do this, uh, ranking these triangles for, for this mutual information, like the then what we find is most triangles have zero relevance. So if the score of the triangle is zero and just a few of them are really important. Uh, and then when you make that projection, so if you go into the triangles that are Seems to be the animation that's killing the internet. <laughs> give it a minute, if not, I if he needs to reconnect. Seems like we lost him completely now. That's a shame. Um, wanting to reconnect. Yes. Let's, oh, you're back. You're still on mute. Sorry, I was talking to myself. I think I spent like five minutes just talking to. It wasn't that long. It wasn't that long, don't worry. Ah. <laughs> yes, we lost you again. If you can reshare your screen. Oh, yes, yes. So you have to tell me where you lost me. Of course. I'm afraid that this, I think maybe these animations are too heavy. I don't know. I was saying that, yes. So we lost you during the animation of this slide. Okay. So then I, uh, I can continue in the animation. So what we found so far is that there is a, a small number. I think about 46 of those triangles are really relevant and the rest have zero hardness. So they are not important under this criteria. And then when you project this into the brain, uh, that there are meaningful patterns. So this uh, is an average of 100 individuals from the Human Connectome project. And you can see those areas, if you know a bit of a neuro anatomy, this is like a pre and post central uh, gyrus, those nodes. So that means that this high order hub, you can call it like the motor, sensory motor hub. And uh, when you make this signal processing, they, they, these patterns are emergent. So we did, didn't do any hypothesis about uh, the functioning of the brain. We just make a hypothesis that uh, the brain can talk between three areas. So that, there is a coffee between areas of the brain. They, they, they gather together and talk between three people like, like we do in our daily life. So there, there is conversation between three areas of the brain. And, uh, and when you select the most important uh, conversation kind of uh, uh, hubs, then you see that this is compatible with the motor system. Uh, if you change your metric, you have a different uh, uh, pattern. So that I will come back soon. But if you go to interpretation, uh, that's at the help of uh, neuroanatomists like Antonio here. So these slides are from his classes. So basically, you know that the, the pre and post uh, central gyrus, they are responsible for sensory and motor uh, tasks. 
like a like a primary motor and sensory cortex, and uh, they are completely like they're really synchronized. They are already coupled. So that means that there is, if you think about the sensory motor system, there is already a link between these two areas. So anything that's extra must be a triplet. If you think under this perspective, like uh, they are so uh, correlated, the, the pre and post central gyrus and so complementary. Like if it's uh, give like if you have a stimuli like that's a, th a thermal stimuli and you have a motor task. Like if you touch, of course, this does not need not even go through your brain, but if you touch uh, hot water, you move your hand immediately. So feeling is sensorial, moving is motor. So there is a strong coupling between your motor and sensory areas. And to make this segregated uh, function is like a, this PYS coupling, but anything that integrates the rest of the brain then uh, requires a three-point interaction. So if you want an interpretation of the result that is more neuroscientific, that would be the idea. So these two nodes are doing like sensory motor stuff and they, there's like segregation here. And they, they, if you want integration, they are communicating with the rest of the areas of the brain. So that this pattern happened for any of those joists. I'm only showing the motor because it's like easy to, to explain. But if you do, uh, and an interesting thing is for the three point interactions is more like primary function. So if you do, uh, now a second metric, so like I show here, uh, like the intersection between the pairs, uh, this uses a vision hub. So like I'm doing the same uh, as I did before, but with a different connectivity rule. So saying that I, I want to understand the three areas of the brain that share information on the, this perspective, like uh, this, the, the sum of the pairs uh, the intersection between all the all the pairs together, so that yields uh, vision. Area. So then the these are things that the cuneus, like the left and right cuneus, they are part of the vision system. They interpret a vision stimuli and then they spread it to the rest of the brain, and that would be like a way to to go over it. If you do that for different metrics, you you still find this pattern, of course. This is just the beginning, then you need more interpretation, what it means, how, how this can be applied, uh, and things like that. But that was like where I could, uh, would like to stop here. And, and I want to say that, okay, build up higher the brain network based on these metrics. For each metric, you have this pattern, and these are compatible with this segregation information principle, and some hubs are really compatible with different systems in the brain. Uh, I think, uh, that is like ongoing work. So we want to make a publication more methodological on how you can make this signal processing. And later we do like more application of oh, what does it mean to the brain? Does it correlate to clinical? So because this is a motor, does it correlate with motor uh, tasks or motor tests that you do uh, in this on those database? So that's the next steps. So thanks. I'm sorry for, for the freezing moments, but I had a good time explaining the work. For you, I hope to get feedback uh, the remainder of the time. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions already? Not yet. I'm, I have okay, one yeah. if it's okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, I just wanted to ask uh, Fanella, well, thank you for the presentation. I've seen the work for a longer time and it's always fascinating. Um, if you wanted to jump from this three-point interaction to four-point interaction, would it be like a small step or is it a big calculation and mathematics quest? Uh, how is it to move to a higher order, uh, even higher? Yeah. And of coding, so if I tell to my code that I want four signals, it works. So it's basically you, these metrics that exist for any order. So if I want to say I want the communication between five areas of the brain, you can measure it. You, it's always based in set theory. So you'd have like four sets and then you want to check if there is information shared between four signals. So in terms of mathematics, it works. And I already did, uh, I, I didn't put in the presentation, but uh, the lower order, like three point interactions are more primary stuff. And then you, uh, we did like for 10 people only. Uh, for four order, it, it, you have like more DMN stuff, like FPN stuff, more, uh, uh, complex uh, uh, structures in, in the brain. 
there is a drawback it's combinatorially like all the pairs in the brain use like if you go to this atlas you have like about 5000 areas in the, uh, pairs in the brain if you go to all triplets you have 120000 triplets but quadruplets you have like 2 million quadruplets so the limitation is in terms of uh, measuring so if you want to measure all the quadruplets you can do but you need a good computer and good memory but for five you'll be even harder so you may run out of memory if you have a very refined atlas uh, but what i would say if you put more interactions you get more info about the brain but every time is more just a contribution so if you make analogy with physics the most important interactions are the PYs, but the three-point interactions are also very important, but to give a, a like refined information. And then the fourth point interaction will be important, but with less um, in magnitude. So it's more like every new order adds less. That will be my view, but it still adds. And the, the big challenge today in neuroscience is to know the details. So if you want to, to, to get to understand the uh, modular structure in the brain, what we know is already nice. But if you want to say, oh, I want to trace a cognition at individual level, or I want to trace uh, your motor skills at individual level. So if you want more refined information, uh, it could be a, a good direction to investigate the uh, high order interactions, because this contributes that you can check what is extra on top of the PYs interaction. So yeah, I don't know if it, that answers your question, but computationally, is feasible in terms of the code that we have and and that will be available when it, we have the publication can do more orders but uh, there is a memory limit basically yes thank you very much uh, if i might just jump in on that so um how long does it take you to compute this to begin with in the beginning it takes uh, two or three days once the code is nice okay. and polished, it takes now five minutes. So oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> it's very feasible to complete yeah, yeah. the interaction. Um, and then you said that the computational time scales up with the increasing um, interactions between hubs. What would be your guess in terms of how many interactions there are realistically in the brain? Um, where there must be a computational limit of some sort as well. Um, I was just curious what your guess is, how many interactions there are, because that many areas are connected to many areas in the brain. I wouldn't quite say that everything is connected to everything, but we're not quite far away from it. So that leaves potential for many, many interactions, um, plus the dimensional aspect of certain functions, for example, might require more interactions than others. So I was just wondering what your take on this was. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So I mean, still the pragmatic side of what's feasible, what's not feasible. So to the feasible side, I think five is up to five is feasible. When you have better computers, maybe you can go beyond. And I mean, your side in terms of uh, <laughs> I'm not getting my answer. <laughs> I love the standstill posture though. <laughs> right, I might have to uh, ask him in, in private another time. <laughs> and give the uh, floor. Uh, <laughs> we lost you again. Um, and you missed the joke. So I was saying like, if you want to, to read my thoughts, you may need more interactions. But if you want just to, to get a vision motor like a basic uh, functionally, I think three, four, you'll be fine. So the more refined you want to go in terms of knowing the, the relation between function clinics and behavior and structure, the more you would need to go. But the, the addition, at least from the theoretical perspective, every new order adds a bit less, like a, like you know these mathematical tricks that like you have an approximation for pi, let's say, then 3.14, 1, 1, 1, each digit adds more to the, the approximation of a number, but uh, it adds less in terms of, uh, it's just a, a smaller contribution. So I, I would give a guess of feasibility, I think we can 
reach five for this atlas. Reality, it could be 10, 11. So if you go to these analogies for the TDA papers from the brain, Blue Brain Project, they say that if they got, go up to 13 or 11. You have to go to the reference, but beyond 10. So that would be my... Thank you. And Victor, I have a question for us. Yes, uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, how stable are these results uh, across subjects? Is it uh, like something that you can see is consistent on each one or it's a group only on a really, uh, you can only see it really at the group level or? Yeah, so I have prepared a bonus slide for your question, but uh, that I knew that could come. So what I report now was uh, on the, and uh, average at group level. So I basically made this calculation for 100 people and I create a mean of those 100 uh, three point interactions. And then I check uh, what uh, this corresponds. If you do individual level, is a rest state, each person uh, we have similar pattern in which sense that there is always two areas that are really super couple. And then there is a, this, when you see this animation, you, you understand the pattern. Like there is always two high order hubs doing some segregated activity and then uh, connected to the rest of the brain. In terms of reproducibility, uh, this is reproducible. In terms of, uh, oh, are all the people motor areas? I, I would say most of them. Like we have a statistics that I didn't include here, but uh, you can, most people, they do have like a, in on the three point interaction of vision and motor has the, the hubs, but it's not uh, uh, unique because we are also not unique and depends on what you do in rest state. But uh, yeah, it's fairly good, I would say, at individual level. It's a, it's a signature of your higher order connectivity. All right, thank you. So, uh, well. Ah, I yeah. mentioned, sorry. Sorry, can you hear me or? I can. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question actually regarding the first part of your talk. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my mic microphone has some problems, so I couldn't ask the question before. Um, I was wondering in the first part, um, do because you look at the moments where um, the uh, Euler characteristic number changes when you add connectivities that are uh, have less weight. Um, but um, have you actually looked at like the populations of uh, neurons that you involve in there? Because I guess you look at the whole brain, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a good question. So in our lab uh, at the moment, we are more focusing imaging network and uh, modality. So we don't have, uh, we, we aim to have a uh, neuronal data, but at the moment you only do uh, imaging networks like uh, fMRI, EMG, so in, in our own work, we didn't compute the other characteristics for neural data, but if you want references, you can go to Catherine Hess lab. So it's in uh, Lausanne. So she has lots of papers on, on those metrics for neural okay. data. Okay. So, All but, right. it's more, but they don't investigate in, in terms of the transitions, but more how to how the other characteristics is a signature of a stimuli in a neuronal data. So yeah, I would say you can do it. I didn't do it, but. Uh, okay, was, okay, yeah, no, that was my question. So the, <laughs> when you say that two points would um, synchronize or would you're doing, you're basing the synchronization on the, like the shared information in the MRI, right? Or in imaging. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And for, for the spiking, you have some uh, time scales that you have to estimate and then you, just create your spiking network and then you compute yeah, okay. those, those clicks, but then you, it's a different uh, setting. Yeah, uh, no, my question was more like, uh, you're taking um, images and you're doing this um, synchronization and this information, I mean, this information links between areas of the brain on the whole brain, right? Not on, sub, on like smaller parts of the image. Yeah, the whole brain. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you. Uh, Ahmed has a question. Hello. Hi. 
Um, so thanks for this great talk. Um, my question is about, well, first of all, um, some I want I'm seeking some clarification for for my own sort of purpose. Back back at the beginning, you were defining these um, polyhedra that you're finding and you know def defining them based on, of course, uh, vertices, edges, and you know you create finally the face of a polyhedron, so you can compute the overall or their characteristic. So my question is more uh, about how do you conceive of this in in network terms? What is a face? of a polyhedron in the network, right? If you could maybe give me a bit of insight onto how you think about that one specific concept. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's uh, in terms of geometry, ge geometrically you can interpret uh, that two phase are like, okay, full connectivity or isolated connectivity. So in terms of uh, the first transition, instead of having a connected brain, you have a phase that is islands of uh, connectivity in the brain in a fully connected brain. So the first uh, transition would be the so-called like a giant component transition. And uh, the interpretation would be that like at this specific density, you would have uh, very likely that any two points A and B in the brain, they have a connect connection, a path between them. So that's the first interpretation. If you abstract that to more dimensions, I say, oh, now I want to have the same thing, but now four triangles. So then it's the same game. So you start to gluing triangles in the brain, like if you would uh, do in a puzzle. And then at some point, the, the brain will be fully covered of triangles. And then the, 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 the critical density where this happens would be the phase transition. Of course, if you want to see more, even more details, that means that uh, uh, the emergence of loops. So when you have a huge path, so the, the loops, in the brain, uh, these are in in, the, in a more detailed uh, uh, fashion. These are the, the signatures of the transition the, of these loops uh, in the brain. So the loops of link, links. So the first transition, the second transition will be loops of triangles and loops of uh, different uh, polyhedra. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, great. Um, and and if I could just. Uh, do, I don't know, Steph, do I have a bit of time to explore here? Great. Um, and and when you're defining your um, the triangles, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, we're used to speaking of a network uh, analysis and, and thing like this about vertices and edges, right? But we never talk about uh, triangles or faces, right? In the in the mesh terms, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're when you're including now an entire face. Right, an actual face of like a triangle in your model to define the earlier characteristic of a manifold. Uh, so, so in, in this specific instance, when you think about a, the the triangle itself, right, not just the edges that are connected, are there any any insights that you gain from just the triangle itself? Um, and does this in any way contribute to your conception of a network other than just edges and and, and nodes? Yeah, that is a very general question. So I would say this is more problem uh, dependent. Uh, yeah. the, the general answer is like a geometrical answer. But uh, if you go to each problem, you would uh, maybe have a better uh, explanation. But yeah, the, the, there is a difference in terms of what the first part of the presentation, I assume that those triangles are just the sum of the links. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, there is a difference, like in terms of you know when there is full connectivity, uh, and the second part I, I we can call it the true triangles. Like you get uh, three signals, and then you check if these three signals they are really sharing information. So this, yes. if if I would answer under this perspective, there is a, a lot of added value because you really check checking whether there is communication between those three areas. And uh, in the other side, it's more. Uh, geometric. I don't know if that was enough, but if you go to the literature, like there, there are a few papers, so each problem, you would come uh, uh, with a different uh, interpretation. I, I like a lot okay. the one right. yeah. on, yeah. on uh, attention deficit disorder because they unify the, the understanding in networks. So the, the, there were, like there is a problem of reproducibility in neuroscience, where for every study, even the same question, you have a contra not contradictory, but opposite results. So they, in that specific paper, they show that when you understand uh, using TDA, the, the, the difference between uh, uh, 
uh, developing uh, kids and uh, ADHD uh, kids, you, you will find like, the interpretation gets more clear. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say I'm not, I don't dare to say a, a unique uh, interpretation, but each right. one you can find it. Great, thanks. And if I may ask just one, one last here about, uh, someone asked already about reproducibility and, and so on. Uh, maybe I missed it. You mentioned using HCP data mainly in your work. Yeah. Uh, so my question is more about, like, do you see any potential effect from any varying of any of the resting state parameters on how these networks might emerge in your in your analysis? And have you already perhaps done any replication and seen the same type of effect in a healthy population on, you know, with non HCP data? Yes, that's a good question. So I, I told I had on a slide that was more I will show it I can uh, come to that. So in terms of what we did, so I'm reporting what I found in ACP, but I test in different data, but small samples. So the pattern I produces, but uh, I, I don't dare to say I didn't do all possible atlas or like uh, I, I would stick to the data that I have, but it's reproducible in the sense that you have these hard hubs in any brain network that you analyze. But uh, there is, Variability on where are those hubs, but not that this, those hubs exist. So if if this problem would fail, I think this that you would find random triplets. Like a true failure of this approach, because this is only the beginning, is to find random triplets that are distributing the brain. If you find a distribution of uh, hubs that are kind of uh, compatible with a specific function, at, at least at this stage, would be. Uh, interesting. So then I put the bonus slide that I promised that I didn't show. These I, I think we don't report now in the, oh, sorry, I have to I have to put in the presentation mode or get out of the presentation mode because it was not in the slide. So it was hidden, but this is the bonus slide. So basically, because these are, these are motor areas, like you assume these are motor areas and they, because this ACP data, you can try to correlate uh, motor scores of those people with the actual triplets. So if you get the strength of the these three triplets, like the the pre-central gyrus, the post-central gyrus, and the the angular gyrus, uh, this in a simple regression, this triplet uh, correlates uh, with a significant like p-value uh, with the the gate gate speed of those individuals. So gate speed is a motor test. So they have like three, uh, two or three motor tasks. And when you correct for multiple comparisons, because I only test for those 46, uh, 46 uh, triplets, you still have a, a p value that's like under the, st the standard descriptive statistics, like still meaningful. I, I put as a bonus because I, I think we should, uh, address this in a specific paper. Like uh, you, uh, we have now hundred people, but we are pre-processing the whole ACP young adult and doing that for the whole young adult. And then testing, okay, let's make a test a database where you check where, what's the whole of those triplets or quadruplets, if you can make that uh, in terms of relating to, to behavior or to like the, the annotated uh, traits that you have from those people and then Let's say that's a, a matter for a second paper. Like now it's like, okay, can we process the brain, in, uh, the signal in the brain in a high order way? Yes or no? I, I would say yes. Is it meaningful? Maybe. Uh, shall we try? Let's try. So, and then so the, ne the next product will be on the higher population and connecting eventually with clinics. And uh, I would say, we don't know exactly the shape of the next product, but we have either the ACP young adult cohort or the ACP aging cohort, because then we know that cognition change as you age, and we want to check if how the interactions change as you age. So there, there is a literature on those, how the interactions has a function of age, but not, not uh, computing these high order networks, just computing this uh, three point uh, uh, interdependence between the areas. So if you want a literature on that, I can also provide it.
No, that's 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 great. Thanks. And and you, you maybe the bio UK biobank might be also a good one for you. Ah, our, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, probably yeah. A good one. I forgot to mention that we didn't put in, in for us yet, but a colleague in UK he said you should also do the it's like four thousand people or so, right? It's yeah, like, it's, it's much bigger than the HCP and it's cross-sectional and you know it's uh, but maybe they, they have shorter resting state, I think. So that might be a different uh, factor. Well, but probably. might be good for you to test the, the length of the resting state data, how that might also affect your, you know, uh, influence the results. But yeah, all good for my part. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Very interesting. Lovely. Uh, this is all we have time for. And we saw your little pop up earlier. It's time to end the day. So we're going to let you do that for today. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, for everyone else in May, so next month, we won't have a CNS talk because our usual last Thursday of the month is falling onto a bank holiday. Um, but we'll see you again the week after OHBM uh, on the 30th of June for mapping brain function with ultra high field MRI. So that's gonna be a very cool talk uh, in June, not next month. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for the exciting questions and see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oui. Right, so end stream on YouTube, I guess. Yes. Thank you.